In this video, we're going to look at genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. So this is when we add DNA, or genes, from another organism into a plant or an animal. We are just going to look at some examples and the general process of how we make them. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we can genetically modify a plant and how we can genetically modify an animal. So let's look at a few examples of organisms that have been genetically modified. Here we have Mr. Green Jeans. He was the first cat that is a glow-in-the-dark cat. So how this happens, they take a GFP, or a green fluorescent protein gene, that came from jellyfish, and they insert that gene into cells that are connected to a promoter that will transcribe proteins in the mucous membranes. So then, whenever mucous membrane-specific proteins are produced, the green fluorescent protein is attached. And so then, we can see Mr. Green Jeans in the dark. When we modify animals, it's very important that the gene is connected to the correct promoter so that the gene is expressed at the right time, in the right amount, in the right cells. So next we have corn. Corn has been modified to in a few different ways. One of the ways is that it can create its own pesticide. So there is a bacterial organism, a soil organism, that makes a toxin called Bt toxin. And this protein, when it is expressed by the corn or the potatoes or the other plants that also have been genetically modified to produce this, then whenever there's insects that eat those leaves, then the Bt toxin will kill those insects. So then farmers don't have to spray their fields with pesticides. The plants make their own pesticides. The pesticides are expressed only in the parts of the plant that humans don't eat. So it's expressed in the leaves or the husk or, you know, it's not expressed in the potato or the actual corn. And then this Bt toxin will kill things like potato beetles and corn borer worms and things like that. And then we have soybeans. Soybeans, almost 95% of the soybean crops in the world are now genetically modified soybean crops. And a lot of them have been genetically modified to be resistant to a herbicide. So one of the most common herbicides is glyphosate, or also called Roundup. So then these plants are called Roundup Ready soybeans. So when you have a whole field of soybeans, and the farmer sprays with a herbicide to get rid of the weeds, the soybeans don't die. So they are resistant to the herbicide. So many plants have been genetically modified so that they will resist herbicides or they will produce their own pesticides. Everything from tomatoes, cotton, corn, tobacco, a lot of different plants are now genetically modified. Next, let's look at genetically modified mice or transgenic mice. A lot of different mouse models have been created to be used for research purposes. And one way that we can modify mice is to delete or mutate a specific gene and then see what happens and see, try to figure out the role or the function of that protein in certain cell types or in the whole organism. So if you had, say, a Conexin 43 knockout mouse, then that mouse is going to be born without Conexin 43. You can see, is that gene required for life? And it turns out that it is. So only heterozygous mice will survive. It's a way that we can study the effects of different genes and proteins in a living organism. Another thing that we can do with mice is we can insert green fluorescent protein, GFP, just like Mr. Green Genes, and we can tag certain proteins. So if we connect that GFP gene to another gene that you want to follow the expression throughout the cell, either in cell culture or in a whole mouse, then you can say, say you wanted to find out where something like, say, erythropoietin, when is that expressed? Okay, so you can tag that gene with GFP. And then, wherever that gene is expressed, you will see fluorescent green. And then we can look at that under UV light. There are several different fluorescent protein tags that can be used or inserted into animals, like our Rudolph the red-nosed cat here. <laughs> so we can use green, blue, red, 
um, fluorescent proteins, we can use luciferase. Luciferase comes from fireflies. That's that white, sort of glowing bright light. We can take that gene and we can insert it into cells and animals to see what's happening. Some of these fluorescent genes have been put into zebrafish or tetrafish, little fish that live in aquariums. And now you have kind of like a nightlight. So we can make fluorescent glowfish. Usually you need either a blue light or a black light to be able to really see the fluorescence. In normal light, they just look very bright. They look like really bright fish. So those fluorescent genes can be inserted into organisms and then they can be expressed. Next we have salmon. Some salmon have been genetically engineered in fish farms to overexpress growth hormone. And so then those fish will grow really quickly and much bigger, and that increases the amount of food that we can have. A couple of other examples, we can make animals that produce medication. There are cows and pigs and mice and hamsters and sheep and goats that can all produce different kinds of pharmaceuticals that are either proteins, they have to be proteins because they have to come from a gene, and then those proteins can be used to produce clotting factors or to make erythropoietin hormones, um, cancer medications, arthritis medications. So there are a lot of animals that have been genetically engineered to contain a gene that will express a specific protein in the milk so that when you milk those animals, I don't know if you milk mice, I don't know where the mouse proteins come from, to be honest. <laughs> and then you can extract those proteins and you can use them to treat all kinds of human conditions. There are now cows that use the CRISPR technology that I talked about in my previous video that can produce human antibodies, which could be very useful. You can infect the cow with a, some kind of a virus and the cow will produce antibodies against that virus that are human antibodies that can be used to treat a human that gets infected with that virus. Because if we gave a human cow antibodies, the human would react to that. Right, that would be just as bad as being infected with a virus. So if we can make human antibodies, there won't be an immunological reaction to the cow aspect of the antibodies. So that's interesting. And we can even make some plants produce pharmaceuticals. Carrots, for example, have been used to produce an enzyme that can be used to treat a rare disease called Gaucher's disease. Another one I wanna mention is Enviro pigs. So pig manure is usually highly concentrated with phosphorus, which when it runs off of farms and goes into streams and lakes and rivers, it's, very, um, it's a very important nutrient for many plants and algae, and it can pollute the waters, and it can cause algae blooms, which will fill the water, which can then suffocate the fish. So having too much phosphorus running off of farms is bad for the environment. So we have enviro pigs that have been genetically engineered to produce phytase that breaks down phytate, which is a plant molecule that is a sort of derivative of phosphorus. So if the pigs in their saliva can produce this enzyme and they can digest the phytate, then they're excreting less phosphorus in their manure and then it's better for the environment. So enviro pigs. The last example that I wanna talk about is called a biosteel goat. This is where we can have goats that produce spider silk in their milk and we can use it to make all kinds of products. So I'm gonna go through the steps very generally, of how we can produce a genetically modified animal, and I'll use the biosteel goat as an example. So first ingredient, we are going to need a gene that produces spider silk. This gene is going to come from an orb weaver, which is a really cool, huge spider, and that gene has to be connected to a very specific promoter. Because remember, we don't want this spider silk gene to be expressed anywhere other than in the milk during lactation. So it has to be connected to a promoter that will regulate the transcription so that it is only going to be found in the milk. 
So we will use a vector that contains the correct promoter with our spider silk gene, and we need to insert it now not into bacteria like we talked about with how to clone a gene, but actually into an egg cell. So a goat egg cell, because we want this to be expressed in goats. Now we use this process, this procedure called micro injection, where under a microscope, you have this very, very fine, tiny needle that will inject this vector containing our DNA directly into the nucleus of an egg cell. Now that egg cell, once fertilized, we can grow it in a dish. This is kind of just like, minus the in micro injection part, we grow cells in vitro for human fertilization, like in vitro fertilization all the time. So we can grow these cells in a cell culture. And then we have a transgenic cell population because this first cell will go through mitosis and it will start to divide. And then eventually it will get to a point where it becomes a blastocyst. So normally, once an egg is fertilized with a sperm cell, it will go through mitosis until it becomes a blastocyst. So now we're just doing the mitosis step in vitro, and then once we get to this blastocyst stage, this is when it is ready to be implanted into the uterine wall. Once this blastocyst is ready, it will be implanted into a female goat. Now this female goat will have been given hormones that make the uterus ready for pregnancy. Then that goat is pregnant and it goes through the whole developmental process and then when it has babies it is going to have transgenic offspring that now express our spider silk gene in the mammary glands and then when these goats grow up and start lactating, then the spider silk can be extracted and we can have all of these really strong spider silk strands that are stronger than steel and we can make all kinds of products out of it. Here's a few things. The very first thing that was made out of bio steel was a bulletproof vest, but we can make everything from sporting goods to running shoes and clothes and cars. So that's kind of... That's kind of cool. So the process of making a genetically modified organism is much longer. So we have to start with an egg cell, inject the DNA. Then that egg has to grow into a blastocyst. Then it has to go through pregnancy, right? Gestational development inside of a mom goat. Then the baby has to be born and then it has to grow up and it has to get to the point where it starts lactating. So obviously this is only gonna work in the females. So it's a much longer process to make a genetically modified organism compared to our transgenic bacteria where we inserted a gene and in 24 hours, bacteria can produce a whole bunch of proteins. So there's many, many plant and animal organisms that are now genetically modified. I wanna look a little bit at how we can genetically modify a plant. So different kinds of plants can grow and germinate in different ways. So the example I'm going to show you is using a TI plasmid. There's a bacterial species that lives in the soil and it has a plasmid, just like the bacteria, the E. coli that has plasmids that we talked about before. These plasmids contain genes that cause tumors in plants. And so these bacterial organisms can infect plant cells. So what genetic engineers have done is they've removed the tumor causing genes and they can replace it with genes that do other interesting things like have produced BT toxin or have herbicide resistance or drought resistance. And so then that bacterial organism can still infect the plants, but it now won't cause tumors. It will express the gene that was inserted into that plasmid. Sometimes there are plants that can grow from single cells. So we can culture plant cells, let the genetically modified bacteria infect the plant cells, and then the plant cells will replicate, and then they can germinate and grow into a genetically modified plant that is expressing that new protein. 
Some of the plants that can be grown this way include carrots and tobacco and tomatoes and potatoes. Not all plant organisms can be genetically modified this way. So the grains like wheat and soybeans and corn, they are genetically modified in a different way. But this just gives you an example of how we can insert genes into plants. It's a little bit different. So with animals, we have to put the DNA into an egg. And with plants, we either have to move the DNA into a seed or we have to infect the plant cells and let them grow. Plants can be modified in a bunch of different ways. So we've talked about how they can produce their own pesticides, how they can be resistant to herbicides. We can make them hardier, so we can make them drought resistant or cold tolerant. We can have them produce antiviral proteins, like we can stimulate the plant's own natural type of immune system. Like in papaya plants, they produce their own immune molecules that prevent them from getting infected with ring spot virus. And then we can also add nutrients. So golden rice has been genetically modified so that it contains a gene that will allow the rice to produce beta carotene, which is a precursor for vitamin A. So there's lots of ways that we can genetically modify plants. In this video, I'm not going to talk about the controversial aspect, but I have included a government website below if you want to look at the link for information about the safety of GMOs.